All right, hi everyone. My name is Gillian Weinman, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Chicago Bungalow Association. It happens to be the first day of fall, so we thought the topic on putting your gardens to bed for the winter would be very useful um, to you as we approach these cooler months. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items in regards to tonight's presentation. Due to the volume of our participants, you'll be automatically muted upon entry. Uh, please type in your questions throughout the seminar uh, in the Q&A window. Uh, questions will be answered um, throughout the webinar. Um, apologies in advance if we can't get to all your questions. Um, the chat room window will be disabled during uh, the webinar. So again, just use the Q&A window. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email within a few days, which will include the full recording of this webinar and also these slides that you're going to be seeing today. Uh, now I'd like to give a very brief introduction to our presenter, Amanda Thompson. Amanda Thompson is a horticulturist, garden designer, keynote speaker, freelance writer, backyard consultant, and author living in suburban Chicago. Amanda wants to help the world live more sustainably, but without a load of effort and twice the fun. Amanda has been working in gardens, garden centers, and landscaping for the last 20 years. Her focus is bringing rule-breaking fun, a little kitsch, and a lot of humor into an industry that is often thought of as full of rules. Amanda is the author of two books, I think maybe a third. Uh, she Just can do. Really just to, okay. Uh, Kiss My Aster, a graphic guide to creating a terrific yard totally tailored to you and backyard adventures. Get messy, get wet, build cool things and have tons of fun. And with that, I'll hand it over to Amanda. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Now I am screen sharing, right? So Help hit that screen share button. Screen share button and we're good to go. And you're good to go. And we're good to go. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you. All right. There we are. Um, so I'm Amanda. Thanks for uh, tuning in tonight. What perfect weather to talk about. Well, it's actually quite warm today and uh, but it has been really autumnal lately and people are thinking about um, putting their gardens to bed a little bit earlier. People are thinking about doing quite seriously everything earlier. Um, I've already seen Halloween decorations, we're already talking Christmas, so let's talk about how to put that garden to bed uh, lickety split. I already see a question, I'm gonna pop in and try to answer questions as we go along. Please discuss care of roses in the fall. Actually, I will be doing that, I promise. Uh, let me close this one question out. Um, okay, so this is me, um, uh, Gillian already, went over all this, so I'm not going to waste too much time on it, but um, if you needed to get a hold of me afterwards, and every time I speak for the Chicago Bungalow Association, I get a, um, a lot of emails that trickle in for a few days for anyone that has extra questions or um, follow up on a screen or something like that. I am always available. If you can put Chicago Bungalow Association in the subject line, so I know that it is, um, you know, important, because you guys are important. Next screen. It's frozen. There we go. There we go. So option number one for putting your garden to bed is to sit back and maybe watch season nine of Call the Midwife on Netflix and call it a day. That's it until April or late March um, to do absolutely nothing and try to find another uh, a garden person who's going to tell you this. Sitting back and doing absolutely nothing is a completely right answer for some people. It's not the right answer for everybody, but it is for a lot of people. I live in suburban Cook County, and I have a rather large piece of land. Um, what I do to get ready for winter is almost nothing, personally. Um, I leave all my perennials up. I leave all my grasses up. Those, um, those plants know how to take care of themselves over the winter much better than I do. Um, I know that some people want a certain look, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a whole other thing. When you want to talk about what's horticulturally best for plants and what people like to look at, those are different. 
Um, I don't remove, I have a huge vegetable garden. I'll cut down the corn stalks because I want to make some spooky decorations out of them, not because they need to be cut down. Honestly, leaving those vegetables in the ground over the winter helps, to, I'm going to talk with my hands a little bit, helps to loosen up the soil, um, helps to add fertilizer to the soil as those old roots decay. And then um, that's really what the soil is looking for if you want to have good soil health. So um, aside from removing some plants that have powdery mildew, um, my husband's peeking at me through the windows. It's cute, I think. I don't know. Um, aside from uh, removing anything with uh, a disease or with any fungus, you can really do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Let me check these questions here. Uh, when she moved to dolly bulbs and how to care for them. That is a great question. And I think I got that one on here. If not, the answer is also very easy. So, whoop. Leaves are a gift from Mother Nature, and I have so many neighbors here in suburban Cook County who act like they are dirty diapers falling from the sky. They are not. They are really what soil is made out of. Uh, if you want to like not lay in bed and think about what soil is made out of, I do. I'll do it for all of us, okay? Soil is made out of decaying things, mostly leaves, branches, twigs. It's all uh, plant matter that's decaying. That's what becomes soil. So when we remove all that, put it in landscape bags and put it up at the curb, you are throwing away that gift. And my neighbors throw away that gift every autumn. So what I recommend firstly is if you have leaves on your lawn, if you can run it over with a lawnmower so that you can crush up those leaves a little bit finer and just leave them be so they decay a little bit quicker. Another thing that you can do is if you can fill up a large garbage can and then put your weed whacker inside like the soup emulsifier, it is exactly like a soup emulsifier, um, and crush up those leaves and then use those crushed up leaves on your perennial beds, on your vegetable beds. Uh, you can trap, tap dress your lawn with it. It is quite honestly, the best thing that you can do as a fertilizer, it is the freest thing you can do as a fertilizer. You already have it. It's a little bit of labor. Um, it's just it's just what you need. On the other picture here on the side, this hoop, um, that is a, um, if you have a hydrangea, the kind that almost never blooms. My first recommendation, honestly, would be that you get rid of it because it's not your friend. But secondly, um, the way that hydrangea works is that it only blooms on old wood, but it gets frozen like in late March when it's coming out, so you never get blooms on it. So the way that you can protect that hydrangea and then get blooms on the old wood is by protecting it with a hoop of, uh, of fencing and then throwing all those leaves in there and then removing the, the leaves in very late March, early April, so, um, so you've protected that plant throughout the winter. Make sure that these are old questions here. Okay. Whoop. Bear with me, guys. All right. So perennials, um, like I was saying, I leave all my perennials, especially perennial grasses. You should leave those because Mother Nature knew her design when she built them. So the way the perennial grasses are, they protect their own selves from snow and, and freeze and frost. So when you cut them, I see a lot of people who just like the look of cutting them down now. Um, you're actually leaving them more susceptible to cold damage. Uh, if you are a big nerd like myself, you're also removing a nesting place for um, beneficial insects, for birds, for, um, I was going to say friendly mammals, but at this point, are any of the mammals in our yards friendly? I mean, not really, but um, it really is a positive place for um, songbirds and things like that to uh, hang out over winter. They'll eat the seeds. Um, birds and butterflies and bees, they all use those as winter homes. And then on the bottom, that looks like a little piece of that great stuff foam adhesive, but that is a, an uthica or an egg sac from a praying mantis, which um, eat a ton of bugs. And I have a ton in my yard because I leave my perennials up. And then we have these big praying mantises around to eat the bad bugs. So I don't have to worry about nearly as many um, marauding insects in my yard as some do. Uh, hydrangeas which grow on new growth, you don't have to worry about those. You don't have to worry about those at all. They don't necessarily need um, any uh, protection at all. So um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then after that, let me scroll down here. This is not my computer. So I'm like, I'm a Mac person and I'm on a PC and it's like, 
the soil in my garden is very compacted. Oh, that's great. We can do that. Soil testing is probably not going to do much for you. Um, is, the, is it the soil? I would like to know if it's the soil in your garden or the garden or the soil in your entire yard. Um, if it's the soil in your garden, look for this product called soil conditioner. It comes bagged. You can get it bulk, but I'm going to assume that bagged is better for a bungalow owner. And what I do with it is a couple things that it's really changed my um, clay soil in my garden. Whenever I plant something in my garden, instead of backfilling with my soil, my, my garden soil, I backfill with the soil conditioner. I also use it as mulch and work it in whenever I'm working anything in in the garden. So um, it continues to work on the, the compaction in my yard. It's magical if you can find it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about compacted um, uh, turf in just a minute. Let me close this out. Bearded iris is one of the few things that you should cut back. Um, it will attract a borers. So you cut it back after a frost, but before the rest of winter, which is a narrow window, I have to say. Um, bearded iris aren't that popular anymore. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about this. I would recommend literally every kind of iris other than bearded iris, unless this is your prize collection. So um, other irises don't have this problem. Oh, I see a bunch of questions here. Uh, let me hit done, done, done. How would you keep newly planted bulbs in the ground? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, why do they never bloom the hydrangeas on new growth? So Karen, that's such a good question and I am here to talk to you about it. Firstly, as Chicagoans, it is our duty to go to Home Depot in the spring for something else, not a hydrangea. And we see these hydrangeas in the blue buckets and they look so pretty. You have to buy one. You have to drop the $35 on this hydrangea because it just feels good. You're color deprived, you're, you're spring plant deprived. You want to buy something that makes you feel good. And it's that hit of serotonin that you, you get tricked to buy this stupid hydrangea. Um, it's just what they do and they only bloom on new they they tell you that they bloom on new and old but really they they are not lying when you get one bloom a year it is blooming on old growth it's just a lousy kind of hydrangea there are great hydrangeas in the world but that that big floppy one the hydrangea macrophylla um is just one that's never going to really work for chicago and i really recommend the panicle hydrangeas which is limelight um, PG, there's moon rock, there's quick fire, there's a ton of them. They have pyramidal blooms. Those will never let you down. They're the best. Um, grasshoppers are harmful, but you don't really have to do much about them. Um, they're not great, but they aren't, they aren't terrible either. They're not, um, they're not going to cause a plague, but they're, they're not great. You can try to get rid of them, but I don't really think that it's, it's probably worth your time. Unless you're seeing a lot of damage that you know is grasshopper damage. I'm not seeing any grasshopper damage, but I know I have a lot of grasshoppers. Um, hollyhock and Cleome seeds in fall. Let's talk about that right now. So you want to just throw those down and that's it. Now's the time to do that. Um, and, and you really want to mimic mother nature and just chuck them and that's it. So aren't you glad we talked about that? You're like, that's not what I wanted to hear. Um, heuchera, what about heuchera? Heuchera is easy. You put it in the ground and it grows forever. Uh, you can elaborate on that, Allison, if you have something more that you want. <laughs> I'm sure that you wanted to hear something other than that. Um, some hydrangea do not have to be cut back. You can cut back an Annabelle. Um, that's the super big floppy with the big white heads. And you can cut that back. Um, they're old fashioned, so, so that might be the one that you have if it came with the house. They're um, native cultivars, they're really cool, and you can cut those back, but anything else you should really leave alone. And you would know if you have an Annabelle. It doesn't stand up for a minute. Not for a minute. Hang on, I'm catching up here. A hardy hibiscus plant. Um, so that is a hibiscus mishutus. I hope it's gorgeous. I love those. So what I would do is leave it alone and then cut it back in the end of March, um, maybe even a little bit later. And there's 
two reasons for that. Firstly, we want the stem to protect itself over the winter so that cold doesn't get into whatever you're going to cut down. And then secondly, hibiscus mishudos, that hardy hibiscus comes up so late that you will forget that you planted it because everything else will already be up and you'll think it's a weed when it comes up. Um, they come up really late, later than anything else in the garden that I can think of. So you want to make sure that you leave yourself a good clue. Can you cut back milkweed and keep them from taking over? Uh, yes, easily. I've done that before. Um, it, it, it absolutely works very easily. You just cut them back and that's the end of it. Collect the seed and give the seed to your friends and then you will have less. They really do take over. It's all for a good cause. Planting bulbs, we'll get there. We're gonna get there. Um, move my raspberry bushes to a summer, sunnier spot. Do that now, do it now. This is a great time for that bloodletting that moving those raspberry bushes is gonna be. Uh, prepping for winter, they seem to die back, but not all have returned every year. Okay, Allison, that's a whole other shebang. Plant breeding is so that when they make new breeds, and I find this to be true with coral bells and also some echinaceas, like the hot new coral bells and the hot new echinaceas just die. They just do. Um, I use really old fashioned ones like um, uh, Purple Palace. It's the most boring coral bell on the planet, but it always comes back. In fact, it, it uh, multiplies. Um, so yeah, that's the, the truth of it, um, is that they kind of like leap out of the ground and then they die. It's bizarre. But usually it's the new cool ones, like the super cool colored ones. Quick, quick fire hydrangea TS, that's the best kind of hydrangea. Buy those. They need nothing from you. Like seriously, over this um, hot, hot summer, if you can, uh, they needed water. But other than that, they need nothing. And you just cut the blooms off in the spring, late spring. Uh, done. 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 How far do you cut hydrangea back? You don't cut, oh, with the uh, Annabelle, you can cut it all the way down to the ground. I like to leave a few, let me tell you this about the, the Annabelle. Uh, make sure it's Annabelle and not one of the colored ones, like the blue ones or the pink ones or the purple ones. It's got a big floppy white one that never stands up. You're supposed to cut them all the way down to the ground in late, um, late autumn. I like to leave a couple, like three or four of the strongest branches, which technically is going to cut back on flowers, but I find that they give more support to the plant. I, I hear myself sounding so nerdy right now because that plant just flops right over. So when you have these old branches, they really kind of help with that a little bit. Okay, uh, done. We get to the bulbs. We're gonna talk about bulbs in just a minute. Uh, we're gonna talk about roses in just a minute. You should bring your mandevilla inside and you're gonna have to trim it back, I think, if it's on a trellis right now. I think you're going to have to. And that those are difficult to keep alive in the house over the winter. So may the force be with you. Rose bushes we're going to talk about. Um, and that sounds like that is indeed the Annabelle hydrangea. So we're going to X that out. All right. And then we're going to get back to your scheduled program. Okay. So you're going to want to remove any plants that show designs of, designs of disease or fungus. So on one side of the screen here, we have powdery mildew. I know that you all know what powdery mildew is. Sanitation is really important with perennials because if you don't clean that stuff up, uh, the leaves that are up in your garden and anything on the ground, you're just going to get that same fungus back again next year. This other slide, this is called aster yellows, and there's about 3,500 plants that can get it. You can see how it's kind of, it's a cone flower and it's got like a little shrubby thing coming out of it. And um, you, it really is very noticeable. And if you see this in your garden, you need to dig it up, double bag it and throw it away. We double bag it and throw it away because if you just um, throw it out there, uh, your dumpster diving neighbor uh, could grab it and plant it in their garden. And you don't want this in your neighborhood. You can also burn it. And um, it sounds like I'm just being a little overboard, but really, if you look up any extension website, they're like, burn it, burn it. So you just wanna be make sure that you're not allowing any disease or fungus to overwinter on the ground around your plants. Let me just check in on you guys. Okay, roses have black spot. Uh, well, here, okay, let's get back to this. We're gonna talk about rose bushes. Cutting back the hostas in fall, Barbara. Here's what I like to do. 
some hostas get beautiful fall color and it would be really sad for you to cut them back before they're ready and you get to see that show. So what I like to do is wait till there's good frost and then the hostas, you can just sweep them up. You don't have to pull, you don't have to yank, you don't have to cut. The hostas will just come away from the ground and you can compost them or do whatever you wanna do with them. Answered, done. Roses have black spot. Um, yeah, okay, so black spot comes from, uh, it comes from being in close quarters, too much moisture in the air, not enough wind. So I would recommend thinning out your roses a little bit and see how that works. I think um, that always works for me. So um, just getting a little bit of extra airflow around roses, that gives them really what they want. Make sure that they're in full sun and that um, you're not overwatering because honestly, black spot kind of makes me think that I need to tell you that watering is not love. Um, transplant hostas now, absolutely transplant hostas now. Do it, it's a great time to do it. That's what happened to your coneflowers, Allison. I'm so sorry, I should send you a bereavement card. Make sure that you get those out because again, they can transmit this disease to 3,500 other plants which you may or may not have in your garden. It's called aster yellows, it's nasty. Cutting back rose bushes, we're gonna talk about roses a little bit later. Um, care for new, newly planted fall blooming anemone. You know, with your fall blooming anemone, it's only a matter of time until it takes over your entire life. So you don't have to do anything to that. Just let it be. Um, but if you want to move the hostas, you can move those hostas. And the sad Rose of Sharon, please get rid of your sad Rose of Sharon because here's, if, especially if it's an old R Rose of Sharon, all, all that Rose of Sharon does is seed out tiny baby Roses of Sharon's. I don't know the plural of that, all over your yard. So get rid of that. It's not that I'm not a fan, I'm just not a fan of the old ones. Clematis vines, here's the thing is there's a lot of, it's, there's a lot of different kinds of clematis vines. I, I never cut them back unless it's the sweet autumn clematis and you would know the difference because the sweet autumn clematis is the one that gets everywhere and has the white flowers, they're blooming now, they're just starting to um, peter out. You can cut those back in the spring other than that, I would leave all your clematis vines. They're not very big, they're not obtrusive, so just leave them alone. Black spots on milkweed, just let it be. I wouldn't even worry about it. That's just, uh, let milkweed be it, what it is. Um, are all plants with black spots on leaves? They're all fungus. Um, and, you know, roses are much more susceptible uh, but yeah, it is pretty much the same thing. It's like a humid air, too much water. Um, it's real common this time of year. A lot of funguses are common this time of year. Um, and airflow and, um, and making sure that air can blow through there is a big, big deal of that. The maple leaves, it is not a problem. It is totally normal. And um, even that, that fungus on the maple leaves doesn't even affect your compost if you were to compost them. Um, why pull up the hosta completely? Well, I'm not talking about pulling up the roots. I'm just saying that once there's a frost, you'll be able to just sweep the leaves up because the, the leaves will no longer be attached to the plant. Also, I, I don't like hostas, but that's another story. Uh, cut down your coneflowers. Do not cut down your coneflowers. Leave them up for the birds to eat. They'll love you for it. They've turned black, but they, um, they're, they're, there's nothing wrong with them, they're just dried. Uh, rhododendron and mountain laurel, can you trim them to a manageable size? I would do that in like late March. Put it on, put it on your calendar for late March. But frankly, you should do it after they bloom. Um, but if they're ancient, I don't know, you, can, you could pretty much get away with doing that anytime. Uh, how to get rid of morning glory, continually pull it up. There's no other way to do it. And I will get back to the show here in a minute. Get rid of that. Um, planted a little lime dwarf hydrangea and even though the blooms of all the stems are laying on the ground and the leaves are completely eaten up, I sprayed them with neem and they still look horrible. I, I'm sure that that's, I, I'm pretty sure that that's gonna be fine. I would just make sure it's getting adequate water through this weird thing that we're having where it's dry for two months and then we get a monsoon for two months. Make sure that it's getting consistent water and I bet it'll pull through. Little limes are amazing. Um, no, but it's nice to get it taken care of. 
If it's pertinent, I'll answer it. And then the other ones get, uh, get filed away for the things that we're gonna talk about. All right. So self-seeders is another thing that you're gonna to want to remove unless you want a million plants. So things like in my yard, fennel, uh, cup plant, some grasses, um, uh, black-eyed Susan, things that you don't want to spread by seed, that's something that you wanna remove. I love reseeders. I think that's free plants, free plants for me to share with friends. So that's something for you to decide. Click. Okay, so let's talk about roses. Now, of course, there's many kinds of roses. Um, really, I'm gonna talk about shrub roses because those are the easiest to grow for a landscape. If you want hybrid tea coverage, that's a whole, like, that's pretty specialized and not too many people grow hybrid tea roses anymore. So with a shrub rose, really, you just stop deadheading at this time of year if you were deadheading it at all. Um, you can leave the hips, the rose hips for winter interest and sometimes birds like to eat those. You wanna make sure that there's no leaves with black spot or powdery mildew or anything underneath the rose bush and then just leave it alone through the whole winter. And then in the spring, early spring, like late March, early April, you can start by removing the dead. And then after you've removed the dead from the rose bush, you then control the size. So like, I'm assuming that um, you guys are all familiar with, um, knockout roses, right? So this is especially true for knockout roses. So you want to make, just make sure that you do that in the spring. I would not mess with them now, I'd just let them be. Let me just check this out. Nope, we're just, when we talk about removing, well, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what plant you're talking about, Samantha. Um, for the uh, aster yellows, you're digging up the root and throwing it away. We're talking about the hostas. You just sweep up the leaves. You're not removing the plant. All right. Black-eyed Susans. Yeah, those can, they tend to seed out, but um, they also uh, feed birds. So that's, you have to kind of decide that for yourself. Can you cut bee balm to the ground? Uh, you can cut bee balm to the ground and then do use very good sanitation at the root. So you want to make sure that you get all those leaves out of there. And you don't want to blow them around because that'll just pass a powdery mildew around other things. Okay. And whoop. hang on. It's like a video game. Okay. So with your vegetable garden, you wanna make sure that you remove any foliage that has a disease or mildew, and that must be thrown away. It can't be composted because then you'll be passing on powdery mildew or that disease in your compost. Um, if your compost doesn't get hot enough to, to um, burn that out. Um, anything else, I leave until spring. I work so hard in my garden, and I'm sure this is you too, and this was just a brutal year. I'm gonna take it easy on myself. And in the spring, I know I'm gonna be itching to get out there. So I, um, I try to do like some positive uh, self-talk there and say, hey, you've worked pretty hard all year. Let's leave this stuff now and uh, get out there in the spring. And I've got a little bit more to say about that. Um, there are some really fun things to plant now. Uh, garlic is great. That is exactly on point if you wanted to put that in the ground now. Um, you can order it now. Let's talk about, this has been a weird year for gardens and garden centers and seed companies. I don't know if any of you tried to order seeds. It's nearly impossible. So um, I've heard that most places are sold out of garlic. You want to look for a, a, music is a great um, variety, or I like to look for anything with like Russian or Siberian in the name because I always know that that's going to be hardy for us. And you plant the little cloves in a line and then you get to harvest the fresh garlic in July. It is awesome. It is so much fun. Shallots, it's not too late for lettuce, spinach, and kale. Um, we may not get that far depending on the weather, but you'll, um, you'll get at least one lettuce, one salad out of it. If you are interested in extending your harvest throughout the entire year, and I feel like this is really, you know, a select amount of people that this is going to appeal to, 
Nikki Jabour's book called Year Round Vegetable Gardening. She is in Canada and she eats out of her garden all year round. She is so cool and so great. And this book is really just, it, it, it it isn't just about year round vegetable gardening. It's just like the only book you need to grow vegetables. Um, it's pretty great. Okay, this is your last chance to take care of your house plants outside uh, before they make a big mess inside. So um, if you have plants that you're gonna bring in, you wanna water them one last good time, make sure that though there are a minimal amount of critters inside. Uh, if you wanna repot them, um, a plant like this, you would cut that bottom layer off. I would just cut off like a quarter of an inch of those roots and then put them in a larger plastic pot. And then the large plastic pot goes dropped into a decorative pot with a saucer inside the pot. That is by far the best way. In fact, I would say the only right way, and I'm not that way about many things, um, to have indoor plants. Um, planting them directly in the pot is only just a ton of heartache. Let me check out questions here. Yep, I talked about vegetable gardens. Uh, you can do a winter cover, cover crop. Um, I would say that that is, it is not worthwhile for me, even though my garden is pretty big. I would say that that is really something for someone who has, has a bigger garden. Um, you certainly can do it. There's some really cool cover crops out in the world. Um, it's just not something that it's like, even though it's a great thing for your soil, I'm leaving my crops in for the winter that kind of do a cover crops job. All right. Battling morning glories for years. Yeah, it, they're just the worst. They are, but they come out really easily. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say vinegar is the best thing to do. I would say if you're gonna, if you have the conviction to use vinegar, I would just go for um, an actual weed killer because Vinegar isn't any better in your soil than something evil from Monsanto. Uh, your husband likes to mulch everything. No, mulch is great. Uh, as long as he is not using more than two or three inches. I mean, if he's really just um, the mulch king of Chicago and everything has eight or 10 mulches, uh, as long as it's away from uh, tree roots and it's away from, so you want the mulch to be around a plant but not on top of a plant, so you don't want it to be pushed up against the, I'm trying to illustrate with this, you don't want the mulch to be pushed up against the stems, but otherwise uh, mulch is fantastic. Um, why is it a heartache? I don't even remember what I was talking about, Robin, sorry about that. I'm, I move quickly, I uh, move very quickly. Yeah, I'm going to justify your laziness because it's the right thing to do for so many plants. What do you do if rabbits eat your blooms? Well, there's a few things you can do. Um, you can use a, um, uh, you can obviously use chicken wire or a deer, um, a deer barrier, which is like a netting made out of black plastic that is almost unseeable, especially from a few steps away. Um, and it really does help. I also have had good luck powder with powdered chili powder and a product called hot pepper wax and spraying that on my plants. Otherwise, I have to say that in my life, I've had very few problems with rabbits. It's probably because I've always had dogs. And so my answer is, if you're having problem with rabbits, the best cure for that is like a couple Dobermans. Okay, so let's talk about bulbs. More than ever in my life, I'm going to recommend planting bulbs, if you, especially if you've never done it before. Um, in the spring, when these bulbs come up, it fills a little crevice in your Chicago gray cold heart that you didn't even know that you needed filled. It is so wonderful when these bulbs start coming up and for a gardener's heart to see all this stuff coming up and to have color where there was none, it's just really magical. Um, for me, I really recommend daffodils, crocus, and allium. Any allium, in fact, helps keep uh, rodents away, any, any rodents. So um, if you have a problem with squirrels taking your other bulbs, plant them in a mishmash with some allium. And there's small ones, there's big ones. They, it really does help. I, I've also had really good luck by putting um, chili powder in the hole on top of the bulbs and then covering them up. 
Um, if a squirrel can plant a bulb, so can you. And I mean, we've all had that weird red tulip that came out of nowhere because some squirrel dug it up down at the park and put it in your yard. Um, I really just can't say enough about planting bulbs. It's, it's really just so fulfilling in the spring. I recommend uh, Brent and Becky's. That's a dog. Um, I'm, I recommend John Sheeper's Beauty from Bulbs even more. They are fantastic and they have a lot of cool stuff. Now the thing with tulips is that they bloom for one year and then after that they're really unreliable. In the Netherlands, they uh, grow those bulbs um, for seven years. They grow the foliage and they cut off the blooms so that it sends all that energy down into the bulbs for seven years to get one beautiful bulb. So um, it's kind of a, a labor of love to put those in the ground and then not have them forever. Planting directly in the pot, um, because it, it, you can, uh, if you plant in a pot without drainage, um, you never know what's going on down there. It, when you need to plant up a size, it can be incredibly hard to get a house plant out of a decorative pot. Um, just using the um, nursery pot with a saucer inside the pot that you drop it right into, you're always in touch with how much water is sitting down there, when it needs to be watered, um, and it's really easy to, to shuffle up to a bigger size. You can divide your daisies now. I recommend it. We got that. We got that. We got that. Did you, did you like the Allium Robin? I hope you did. They're really amazing. Uh, will Allium work? Now? Yes, absolutely, Amira. Allium uh, is great in a vegetable garden because it really is an onion. It really, uh, they really are the, the same. You could eat Allium if you wanted to. Of course, they're grown to be ornamental and not, um, you know, tasty. They still taste like onions. So they're really great. Uh, adding amendments to your vegetable garden. Coffee grounds, leaves, egg shells, all those things are um, only good in your garden if you compost them first. Um, so uh, that is the sad reality of it. And I know that there's a lot of quick, funny, like garden memes and things that it, you know, pass around like, oh, we got coffee grounds, just put them in your garden. Well, they've proven that those really are only good for your garden once you turn them into compost. So you're, the answer is yes, and the answer is also no. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, buttercups have red spots. Don't worry about it. They're buttercups. Buttercups will be here after we're all gone. Um, got that. The allium made your spring, that makes my day. Thank you. Do I put fertilizer or anything uh, when you plant bulbs? That's such a good question. Um, a bulb, similar to a chicken egg, has everything in it that it needs to grow. So I read a lot of things about bulb fertilizer or bone meal or any of those things are gonna break down so far after the bulb is well on its way, I would say that it's pointless. I have never fertilized any of my bulbs and I have a billion of them. They really do just fine on their own. And I'm not gonna say that it's snake oil, but it's kind of snake oil. Uh, veggie garden beds over winter, like I said, I really recommend doing very little with them and letting the vegetables that you grew uh, stand as much as possible, stand for the winter so that those roots that broke up the soil all summer, um, uh, hey, if you guys want me to answer everything at the end, I can, um, but I want to hit them while they're happening because there's like lots of them. Uh, let the roots break things up and stand while the um, while they're there. They're doing the job, they're already ready. They're, as they are breaking down and decaying, they're adding that, um, that lighter, fluffier soil there without any extra work, which I'm a huge fan of. All right. So as I spoke a little bit with lawns, the best thing you can do is mow and mulch those leaves right into your soil. I also highly recommend core aeration. So that is something that if you have a small backyard that tends to, let's just say um, you've tried to overseed and it never works, or you have areas that are like hard as a rock and water pools there, you always have a muddy backyard. Um, you have kids or dogs or both, 
Core aeration is the key. And this is something that you can do, um, I would say most people do it in the spring and therefore it's a lot easier to do it in the fall, if that makes sense. If you're trying to get someone to come out to your house to do the core aeration, um, it's easier to get someone. In the fall, if you're gonna rent the machine yourself, hey, get together with everyone on your block and see if you can do it that way. They're super cheap to rent. It only takes a few minutes to do. Um, you have to watch your feet because you could easily poke a hole in your feet um, but that is pulling out all the different little, uh, it, it has to be something that pulls the cores out. So then it allows water and um, air to get down in, into your lawn and it gives you a, a lot more, it gives you the, the roots of your grass a lot more room to spread out and to go down deeper. And then you leave those cores on top of your um, lawn and you let them decay and they become compost and instant fertilizer. It's pretty great. This is a great time of year to top dress naked spots with really good compost. You can also overseed right now. If you're gonna overseed, I, um, I recommend using a little bit of like a straw blanket or they make a really cool, it's kind of gross, newspaper mulch product. It runs about $11 at a hardware store or online. And um, it's like little pellets of, of newspaper and you spread it over your grass seeds and wet it and it makes sure that the birds or um, mice don't eat the seeds while keeping the grass seeds wet so that you don't have to stay home and babysit it. It's pretty great. I really recommend it. Let's see here. Overseeding is um, just sprinkling seed on top of, um, on top of your lawn and, oh, 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 hang on. In, instead of like doing a whole area or resodding. So overseeding is when you just wanna do a, a little area here or there. Good question. Okay, beep. So it's time to put the hose away, which is a big joke in my household because I will probably put the hose away in February because I like to do things the hard way. You wanna make sure that your spigots are turned off, your hoses are put away, your irrigation's turned off. If you have an irrigation system that requires getting it blown out with, a, 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 I forgot the name of it, but it's like a pneumatic air thing that goes in the back of a truck. It's just a hoot and a holler to get done. Um, your water barrels, you may wanna empty and turn upside down. It's time to take care of all things water. Um, Compost is something that I really believe in. It's a big deal to me, but I know it's not for everybody and I totally get that. Um, the great thing is that there's so many places where you can maybe compost at a friend's house or there's a local compost drop off. Uh, this time of year when there are corn stalks and pumpkins and straw bales, it's good to find a place to donate those or I work at a farm and at after Halloween, when people are done with their pumpkins, we give them all to the pigs. It is the best day of my life. It's the best day of my year is giving these old jack-o'-lanterns to the pigs. So um, get a little creative and find a way to reuse things. I think it's, um, it's valuable. Uh, prepare for the snow. So uh, sodium chloride is um, gonna wreck your plants. Calcium chloride is not. It's a, it's a little bit safer for pet paws and for plants. Guide poles for wherever you're gonna be shoveling and plowing. Burlap barriers are very rarely needed. Some people like to set those up, um, really unless there's, there, there's a plant that you know is gonna get burned from north winds or that they're gonna get um, a plow splashback of salty muck. You really don't need burlap barriers. A lot of people um, suffocate their plants over the winter. All the plants that uh, you can buy in this area are really meant to be able to handle our winters unless you're in an extreme situation. Um, I keep a, um, actually, I don't just keep a stick by the front door. I keep, it's like an old plastic lightsaber that we use to knock the heavy snow off the arbor bodies. I know that that's cheesy. It's true. So um, it's, it doesn't hurt to knock the heavy snow off of um, evergreens when they're starting to split. Winter pruning um, is, it, if you really feel like you need to get out there and, and do some good, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because it's really a select few are gonna wanna do it, but it'll be in the slides um, when Gillian shares all this information. 
And that is it. So let's talk a little bit more about your questions. Okay, so uh, saving grounds and eggshells, how do I compost and avoid mildew on the coffee grounds? So when you just throw that stuff in the compost, it's okay if it mildews, that's just part of rotting. So, um, you know, composting is not much more than throwing things together in a pile and letting them rot. And it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Um, small backyard full of white pine needles. Okay, so I'm assuming you have a white pine. I mean, that's a leap for me. Um, so when your white pine, there's a couple of things. Firstly, white pines are very susceptible to a lot of insects and diseases. So firstly, you're going to want to rule that out. I can't do that from a Zoom, but um, you would probably notice if there was something wrong. Secondly, it has been a very hot, very dry summer. And something that white pines do to kind of save their energy and to keep cool is lose a ton of needles in the inside. So if the needle loss is all on the inside, that's just what they do to, to keep themselves cool. Do I recommend dethatching every year? I, you know, I'm a real core aeration fan. And when you core aerate it, um, really negates the need to dethatch. So you can dethatch. It's not, um, it's not my favorite. Um, honestly, if you spread, if you can get some good compost and spread it on top of, top dress that on top of your lawn, it eats the thatch, which is pretty rad. Um, but you can dethatch. It's just not, um, I think if you're going to do one thing, core aeration is it. When to overseed? You should overseed now. Now is a great time to overseed. Get out there. Your compost is a bit lumpy. Oh my goodness, that's so great. Um, yes, most people screen their compost and you can buy a fancy compost screen or I just use a milk crate. I dump the, I dump the compost in the milk crate and whatever stays in the milk crate gets put back in the compost and then um, I hold the, the milk crate above the a wheelbarrow and everything that goes in the wheelbarrow, it's, that's it. You get to keep it. Compost is naturally lumpy. Not everything is going to break down at the same time. So I bet you're doing a great job. Uh, kitchen scraps to compost over the winter. Such a great question, Rachel. Yes, absolutely. Add them over the, you'd be amazed at how much they cook down over the winter. Great question. Uh, okay, morning glories to cover an unsightly chain link fence. Um, no, I mean, if they're doing their job, I know people who love morning glories. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, I, have some, there's amazing doubles and triple frilly morning glories. There's a, there's great ones out there, but some of, they just reseed and they seed out and seed out and seed out. And then you have morning glories everywhere. So as long as they're staying where, where they need to be, you don't have to really worry too much. Otherwise there's nothing easier than pulling out morning glories. Let's see here. Uh, the last pick of trimming bushes doesn't mean not cutting evenly. Yes. So I'm so glad you asked this. This is a great question. So it is fun to play with a hedge trimmer. It is. However, it is not the best thing for an actual um, bush or shrub. So uh, cutting by hand allows light and air in instead of, so every time you cut, it's, it's really hard to show with Zoom. Every time you cut with an electric hedge trimmer, you cut here and then it, it, it brooms out like this, right? And then you cut it again, and then it brooms out. And eventually you have this top heavy bush with no light inside and everything is dead on the inside. And then it's real heavy on the top. So then it snows and it's holding all the snow. So it's a really good thing to get in there with hand pruners and to loosen up all that um, all that electric trimming that has been done over the years. So you want to make sure that light and air gets inside your bush. Make sure that, um, you know, sometimes even when you've cut with electric hedge trimmer and there's that like tabletop, it's hard for water to get down there um, when it rains. So um, getting in there and hand pruning is great for the health of your uh, shrubbery. Any brand of grass seed I prefer? I do not. They're all the same, really. Um, it doesn't really matter to me at all. It's all, it all, it all really works. If I would just go to the, um, if you, if you're up for going to like Ace Hardware and telling them exactly what kind of situation you have, they would love to, to sell you some grass seed. Um, you know, you just make sure you get the right, if, if it's for shade, don't fool yourself and put sun in there. Get, make sure you get the right one. 
Liquid aerators. Oh, Lindsay, such a good question. Hey, you know, a liquid aerator might work just really fine with a small yard. Um, I just think it's so much more economically feasible, frankly, to get um, an, a, a real aerator in because it just doesn't cost anything. It's it's a pain. It's a big, bulky uh, piece of machinery. But I mean, it's, it is really inexpensive. And liquid aerators, I would say, um, you just don't know. You, you know, you can put that down and then it, you know, how long does it take to work? Um, is it working with the, uh, an actual physical aerator? You absolutely know. All right, not an overwintering question, so feel free to ignore, but I'm looking for some winter interest in my front yard, as well as something with height. This is a great question. Um, they needn't be one and the same. Currently, it's mostly hosta, and I'm slowly doing away with that. The aforementioned sad rose of Sharon and the daffodils are short-lived. So you're looking for an evergreen or some grasses that are winter interest. I, um, I really love the Camaciparus line. So it's, that's a false cypresses. They're, um, it's a funny family of small evergreens. And the, it's C-H-A-M. Uh, why? See, it's very hard. Hang on. Camisiparis. I, I It's one of those things that I can't. And it's going to show it backwards, isn't it? Or if not at all, not at all. C-H-A-M-A-E-C-Y-P-A-R-I-S. Camisiparis. And some of them are three or four feet tall. Some of them are nice and short, but they're all moppy and interesting and very well behaved. Um, and I really recommend those. Um, boxwood is common. Um, if a dog pees on them, they're toast. There's also a boxwood blight that's coming up from the south. So I wouldn't really recommend that. Um, and then for grasses, I would say that there's no better grass for a city yard than, um, oh, what is the common name for it? Spirobolus heterolepsis is prairie drop seed. It's just the right size. It looks nice all winter. It's nice, a nice sandy red all winter. It looks really good. It's well behaved. So that's a really good one. Okay. Creeping Charlie is here to uh, get rid of us. So that's a good question, Sandy. There's no easy way to get rid of Creeping Charlie other than in the spring when it's really wet out is to go out and pull buckets of it or to find neighborhood kids that you pay for the bucket. Um, it, they're really hard to get rid of. This dry, dry um, summer is actually doing pretty good for, um, it's killing a lot of Creeping Charlie, which loves water. So if you are someone who waters your yard a lot, um, you could just be watering the Creeping Charlie, which is maddening. This is your first year of vermicomposting. Will the worms survive outside? No, they will not bring them inside. They will not, for sure. And there's really nothing you can do to get them to, I've tried. Soapy water, uh, get rid of the mushrooms on your lawn. Okay, Mary, I need to ask you why you need to get rid of the mushrooms on your lawn. It shows that you just have healthy decay and um, do not put baking soda on your lawn. Um, I think mushrooms are a thing to delight in and they show that you have an ecosystem. Am I, am I is that a little too crunchy? It might be, it might be. Um, so an ivy vine from the lawn near the wall without killing the lawn. So is it English ivy, um, which is, you know, a, a common thing. That's very hard to, it's really hard to kill. So what I would do is with a pair of pruners, cut down as much as you can until you find the main root and then paint a little bit of brush killer, um, undiluted brush killer on that little stump. And that should be the end of your ivy. Um, squash bugs and zucchini plants. Oh yeah, they're, 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 they're rough. So you can get this, um, like an insect blanket. It's a, um, it's white fabric and you can throw it over your zucchini plants before they get squash bugs and pin it down to the ground. The sun can penetrate, water can penetrate, but the squash bugs don't. So it's pretty great. Um, powdery mildew leaves on zucchini, they just go together. They just, that's just what they do. Um, part of that is them giving, 
it, it's how they break down so that more sun can get underneath. It's just the way they do it. I just, if you pinch those powdery mildew leaves off when they arrive, everything should stay on the up and up. Red twig dogwood this summer, how do I prune it and when? Such a good question. Um, I would not prune it for a couple years and um, until it starts to, um, I would say anything that gets bigger than your thumb, I would prune that down at the very bottom. But I would let it just, if you planted it this summer, I would say that you would not have to really get in there for another three years, two or three years, and then get in there. And anything pruner than your, uh, anything <laughs> uh, bigger than your thumb, prune that down at the ground and leave everything else. Okay, dahlia bulbs. Okay, I'm so great. I'm so glad. I thought there was a dahlia bulb slide in here, and maybe there was, and I skidded right over it. So the dahlia bulbs thing, it is very hard to overwinter them, and maybe you've had luck. I've had luck um, in the past when I had just the right kind of basement, and now I don't have that kind of basement. It's too cold in the garage, so you have to have an unheated basement that has some moisture to it. Um, and then you can try to keep them over the winter. Uh, they can also, I have been told, I have not had luck with this, keeping them in the crisper drawer of a refrigerator with its lights off. I don't have the luxury of having a Dahlia dedicated refrigerator. So I've tried doing this for years and years and years. Frankly, here's what I've arrived to. The cost of the $7.99 Dahlia bulb is not worth the labor of digging it out and trying to overwinter it. I would rather just buy a new $7 Dahlia bulb in the spring because it is a lot of work. So you would put them in a dry peat in a, um, in a labeled brown paper bag in a cold, dark, somewhat moist place. Like they can't be wet, but it, they can't be dry or else they'll just, they'll just dry out completely. It is not as easy as it could be, frankly. Trumpet vine, oh, it is the worst. It is the worst. Um, it just, here's, Rachel, it is just a battle that you, that takes a few years. There was one in this house when we moved in. It's taken us now, um, I don't see any, haven't seen any for the last two years. So um, it's taken six years to keep, to keep fighting it. And now it's finally gone. Um, it's just a, a hard plant to kill. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So you're not calling the morning glories the right name. You have real morning glories. Okay, so are we talking about white? Are we talking about bindweed, which is the worst plant ever? Um, white, uh, little white morning glories, that is bindweed, and it's just impossible to kill. And the best thing you can do is to make sure it doesn't bloom. And then eventually it'll run out of steam, but it is, it's a really hard one. A slow-growing deciduous bush that gets red berries in late fall. It's not winter berry. <sighs> I can't think of what that is. Uh, red berries. Um, and it's slow-growing. I don't know what that is, TS. But if you want to email me, I will get an answer for you because I never give up. I can't think of what that could be. Um, we have a spot in the middle of our front garden bed where we continuously try to plant small evergreens. They do great every spring, summer, fall, and then in the following spring, they, right. Um, why do you keep, okay, so, Lindsay, email me, send me a picture of that space. I bet you there's an easy answer. Um, and, uh, yeah, email me at amanda at kissmyaster.com. I'm sure that that is something that we could fix. Uh, crabgrass and don't want to pe weed killer on my lawn due to do my dogs. Yeah, unfortunately, um, digging it out and that's not fun. But um, you know, here's the thing: is like if crabgrass is so hard to kill, why don't we just have lawns of crabgrass? That's where I'm at. Why do we stop? I mean, it's like we we have to pick our battles and pick what what to to fight. I would say. Um, you know, sure, it's not all the same, but it is always green. And if the dogs pee on it, it's going to stand up to it. But sadly, digging it out is really the best way to go. You could also, if you wanted, you could put down 
corn gluten meal, which would help if the crabgrass is dropping seed, which I doubt that it is in your case, but it is something that's organic and not gonna hurt the dog, so it might do something. And that's something that you sprinkle around like um, preen, and it helps any crabgrass seeds not um, germinate. Uh, can you get rid of Roses of Sharon tree stump yourself is about five inches in diameter. I don't know that you can. I really don't. It's, um, there's like a product that you can get that's supposed to rot tree stumps. Um, but I think it's a scary chemical. So that's up to you. What's the best way to get rid of mushrooms on your lawn? I, I, there, you can get a fungicide. It's, it's easy as that, but they really are just a sign of um, a healthy, seriously, a healthy ecosystem. But you can go get a fungicide, any fungicide will do, because they're fungus. Poison ivy, once and for all. Okay, well, there's no such thing as once and for all, because poison ivy berries get eaten by birds and then drop in everywhere. I use a product called Crossbow. It is a heavy duty brush killer. And you can get it on Amazon for about, I'd say 20 bucks and the amount that you'll get will be enough for the rest of your life. And you can brush that on or spray that on poison ivy and it will look like, it will look like a bomb has gone off for that, that poison ivy. It really is a, a very effective brush killer. Okay, an evergreen shrub that will thrive in complete shade against the house. Use Y-E-W-U, which is the thing that came with your bungalow that you probably hated and had taken out. Uh, that's a generalization, but in um, often people see them as old fashioned and not that cool, but really they are so cool and so old fashioned in a great way. They're what um, the, the topiaries in England are made out of. They're just really uh, adaptable, thriving shrubs that don't mind, the shade. Um, but that's what I would recommend. It's probably not what you wanted to hear, but they're great. Rose of Sharon is not considered an invasive, but um, the old fashioned ones, the really old fashioned ones, like it, when someone's like, hey, I love, design my yard. I don't like this one that Mima gave, um, this one that Mima gave me, I have to keep that one. It's like those really old fashioned ones are the ones that seed out everywhere. And then you have these little rows of Sharon seedlings, which even at um, two or three inches tall, they will not come out. I'm sure you've probably pulled them before, Brianne. You've like tried to pull them out as a weed and they're like, oh, they're, I'm not giving up. Um, the new rows of Sharons, a lot of them are sterile. They're beautiful. They're really easy to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about a, a difficult old fashioned one. Uh, I would try to kill it. Honestly, you're, it's like growing your own weed factory. Like it's just going to make things harder for you further down the line. Yes, plant tulips now. Absolutely. I would recommend not tulips, but any other bulb, but you can plant tulips now for sure. I do. Uh, it could be a cotoneaster. Could be. It is low to the ground. Good suggestion, Carol. They are, I think they are horrible, but I know that a lot of people have, are sentimental about them. So um, I don't want to, you know, slander what Mima gave them to grow in their yard, but I'm, I'm not a fan. All right. Are there any other questions? 93 answered questions. Uh-oh. Oh, thank you very much, anonymous attendee. I want to make, I feel like, I feel like bungalow owners have very similar problems. So this Q&A thing I think is really valuable to more than just the question asker, hopefully. Um, at least that's my, um, that's where, that's my intention. A dying Kusa dogwood, well, that's harsh. Um, uh, why don't you send me a picture, Allison, uh, Amanda at kissmaster.com, and we will discuss the future of your Kusa dogwood. I'd hate to see it die. I love Kusa dogwood. Thank you, Cindy. Of course, Karen. Thank you, Brianne. 
You guys are so nice. Awesome. You guys are so nice to me. Thank you. Um, it's been a weird summer for everyone. Um, one last thing I'd like to say, typically this is a great time of year to plant perennials, but garden centers have had a really tough year in that everyone was home, everyone was trying to improve their yard and there's just nothing left. I'm really worried about what is gonna be available for all of us come spring. So stay flexible. Um, I would start buying seeds if you wanna buy vegetable seeds or even flower seeds. I would start looking for those seeds now and I'm not trying to be like, ah, panic. But, um, you know, I think it's just gonna be a weird year again. How often do I do these? I've done a couple for Chicago Bungalow. You guys are the best as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how they do it. I, apparently people who live in bungalows are just really cool. Um, you saved my garden. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's been a weird year and I'm assuming that I'm assuming that we bought some of next year's stock for trees, shrubs, perennials. So it should be an interesting spring. Yay, Karen loves my book and heard me speak. You guys are so great. I am sure they're posting it um, because Chicago Bungalow Association is great about that. They send an email with the slides and it's on Facebook. So I'm assuming that it'll stay on Facebook. I'm not 100% sure about that. You guys are so nice. Go Gardens, that, I'm gonna, that's awesome. I like Go Gardens. If you get seeds now, yes, yeah, seeds will keep forever. They really will. Um, the expiration dates on seeds are very much a guideline for when they would like you to buy more seeds, to be truthful. You guys are being so nice to me. I'm gonna get a big head. You know, I can talk about the generalizations of gardening all I want, but um, really what's important to me is that I'm answering the questions for people who live in bungalows. So the questions were an important way for me to do this. In my next life, I'm gonna live in a bungalow. Another one in the spring, Amanda, I'm down for it if you are. You can divide plants in the spring or the fall. It doesn't really matter. I like dividing in the fall um, because in the spring I have other things going on. In the spring I'm busy running around like a crazy person getting it all done. All right, anything else guys? Just wanted to thank you. Thank you Sylvia, that's so nice of you. All right. What, we, what time do we have? We're doing good on time. So if anyone else has a question, I'm still here. <laughs> I do have a blog, it's kissmyaster.com. It's old blog, but. Um, you know what I really like for chain link fences in full sun, Brittany? And it sounds like a bonkers idea. I love golden hops. It grows like crazy. It's really thick. It's not very flowerful. Flowerful? But I mean, you could make beer out of it. It, it just grows quickly, good cover. Um, we have many rose bushes that don't bloom all the time. How do you make them bloom? Uh, roses are, are the, I'm hoping that they're shrub roses. And then um, they should just really bloom in June. That's more popular. So for many, many, many years, there were um, landscape rose bushes that only bloomed in June. And then the special thing about Knockout is that it had an extended bloom period. And now they're making some new ones that bloom on and off all summer, but not much past June. So I wanna make sure that I'm not encouraging you to, um, to, to make roses do something that they don't wanna do. Um, like I have a beautiful climbing rose. Um, I do nothing to it um, all winter, but it only really blooms in June. Uh, climbing bloomers, yeah, hops are really underrated. They're really super cool because they grow quickly and they do the cover. So clematis, for example, uh, a regular flowering clematis has a short vine that doesn't do the job and they're not very full, so that doesn't do the job. 
uh, sweet autumn clematis would give you a lot of cover, but not a lot of flowers until the end of the summer. Um, let's see what else would be fun. Like a chocolate flower vine would be really cool. Five leaf akebia, some weirder things. But what you're what you're looking for, I'm assuming, is privacy. Um, and that that I would really just recommend um, hops for that. Ooh, do, do. Clematis for the win. You know, I love clematis, but uh, they're not thick. They are not thick. Vegetables that grow better in the ground than in a raised bed. Um, that's such a good question. Uh, I would say maybe tomatoes because they can really um, get staked and they can really get a lot of water that way. Um, other than that, no. Uh, um, maybe, uh, like I always like to do a couple raised beds. So one of them gets perennials like rhubarb, oregano, um, your herbs that are perennial. So that all goes in one bed. Then one bed for me is all lettuce. And then one bed is all the extra things that you need. So a couple uh, tomatoes, a couple peppers, a cucumber, and that's it. So um, other than that, I mean, you could, some herbs are very beautiful to grow in the ground. So maybe that would be a good, um, a good answer. One raised bed is, is hard. So look at doing your perennials outside of the bed. I would do your lettuces inside the bed to keep the dog out because you really don't want your dog peeing on your lettuce. I mean, that is, wow. Did I just say that? All right, should you attempt to prove an uh, overround cedar? <sighs> Please hire someone to do it. And I don't say that lightly because I'm super DIY. Firstly, I, I'm not sure it's a cedar. And secondly, if it's overgrown, I don't want you to get hurt. It's worth the money to pay for it to be done right. Dwarf lilacs. Um, yeah, okay. So with the dwarf lilac, in after it's done blooming, so we're talking end of April, uh, middle of May, then you can get down on the ground with a pruner saw, which uh, is like a, a, a saw blade that's this long and you, you can hold on to it. And, Cut down anything that's thicker than, a little thicker than your thumb. And what I would do, that I would do this in thirds. So I would get underneath that dwarf lilac and cut down a third of anything that's thicker than your thumb one year, and then get down there that second year and do a third of anything thicker than your thumb. And then the third year, you're gonna complete this, which sounds, this sounds terrible, but really it's the easiest way to do it. Um, and this will encourage your dwarf lilac to stay really full and look really good because they can really look pretty mangy after a few years, can't they? Asparagus, oh, asparagus is great. You put, put it in the ground. It gets huge, it gets really tall and really pretty. It's really great. Um, yes, you can alter the size of your lime light, light like crazy in the spring, Mary. So in, um, why don't in the spring cut it down to where, what size you'd like it to be, and then cut it down another, I would say foot and a half, two feet from down lower than that. So, I mean, hopefully that is, uh, that makes sense. Um, they're big, they're really big, but they're very easy to, to, to prune in the spring. You can really go to town on them. They're very forgiving. They're almost perfect plants. Veggies that grow better in a raised bed, I would definitely say lettuces, spinach, kale, um, carrots, beets, um, things that, uh, like carrots love a raised bed. You can have some great carrots in a raised bed. Rhubarb, you know what? Just throw it in the sun and that's it. Um, you can just make sure there's nothing around it and let it go. And um, you can, if you want to, build little towers around it, around uh, like a little collar of like branches or something so that it reaches up for the sun. Um, but I have to say that I've had rhubarb for a couple years now, and I mean, we have more rhubarb than we ever could just by letting it do its thing. Uh, it could have been, I mean, did the lilacs come back after they turned brown? Because it could have been the frost for sure. Um, they're tough, weedy old plants. They can also, uh, I'm not 100% certain that lilacs 
couldn't um, contract some kind of a wilt, like verticillium wilt, which is something, if you want to email me, we can talk a little bit about your lilac through email. That's amanda at kissmyaster.com. How do we keep pastas from burning out or getting eaten up by the pest before the winter? Well, if they're getting burned out, they're getting too much sun. So make sure they're in the shade. And then the pest thing is difficult because slugs love hostas that are in the shade and they're, um, it's like a salad bar. There are new hostas that are slug resistant. And I have to say, I really recommend that because otherwise it's, um, it's a real challenge. It is, uh, it's just kind of prey and predator in a classic, this is, this is what they eat, this is how they do it. So I wish I could be a little bit more uplifting about that, but um, make sure if they're burning out, they need more shade and more water. And the pests, that's just difficult. There's not really any, um, any easy answer for that. All right, do you cut mint to make it bushy? Yep, you just cut it all the time. And I mean, all the time. With any herb, it's at its happiest and healthiest if you're using it and not saving it. So just use it anytime. Anything else? We're at 143 answered questions. And I'm here for you. All right, that's the end of it. I will be signing off as soon as I can figure out how. <laughs>